uh, hi everyone good afternoon so uh, i am here again to bring you the second session part 2 of the basic questions on bleeding in pregnancy please let me know if i am visible and audible to all of you we have done questions on ectopic molar pregnancy abortions in the last session and now i am doing questions on uh, abruptio on placenta previa and uh, placenta accreta uterine inversion pph now okay good so i've got a signal from all of you that i'm visible and audible so let's begin today's session now the first question which we have to do which is question 12 we left on question number 11 last time so let's read this question very carefully the question is saying true about abruptio r and your options are number 1 it is it can lead to prolonged labor number 2 it is more common in primary gravida females number 3 ultrasound is diagnostic in most cases and number 4 per vaginal examination can be done in abruptio right now amongst option 1 2 3 and 4 you have to tell me which are the true statements option a says 3 and 4 are true option b says 1 and 3 are true option c says 1 and 4 are true and option d says only 4 is true so tell me quickly what do you say I have got one option, and the uh, you are saying option B is right. That is, one and three are true according to you. All those who are viewing are saying that option B is correct. Okay. All of you are saying option B is correct. All of you. Please, I am not prejudiced. I am not biased. but i just want you to write and tell me whether you are a maro subscriber or not because you know i really feel very disheartened when i get incorrect answers from maro subscribers that after listening to all my lectures you are giving me incorrect answers okay uh, a and b okay a Uh, earlier it was everyone b now everyone a someone has said d and i can't read who has said d afreen sagar okay right so let's quickly see now okay okay stop writing i've got the correct answers and very few of you have given me correct answers very few okay now let's talk about abruptio quickly see now in entire obgy i want all of you to remember risk factors for four conditions very important four conditions you have to remember risk factors number 1 for abruptio all the risk factors you have to remember number 2 for placenta previa all the risk factors you have to remember number 3 for pih PIH risk factors are very oftenly asked and PPH so if you cannot remember risk factors for all the conditions which i have told you in gynae these four conditions risk factors all of you are going to mug them up by heart PIH abruptio placenta previa and PPH right these four risk factors you are going to remember now right now when we talk about risk factors for abruptio so risk factors for abruptio the uh, abruptio is more common you remember in the videos i have made a figure and shown you but if you cannot remember that female please remember the risk factors for abruptio most common risk factors for abruptio are risk fa uh, abruptio is more common in smokers number 1 number 2 if there is folic acid deficiency number 3 in cocaine abusers number 4 if a female has pih right so in case of abruptio you will get a history of pih or if hypertension in pregnancy then please remember that placenta previa and abruptio both of them are more common in with increased maternal age and increased maternal parity so they are more common in multi gravida females 
then if there is history of trauma that's a risk factor for abruptio or if there is polyhydramnios prom uterine anomalies and fibroid so all these are risk factors for abruptio you will you can get a straight forward direct question on risk factors for abruptio right now if they ask you maximum risk maximum risk of abruptio is seen if there is a previous history of abruptio right now this line over here is very important please remember that antepartum hemorrhage whether we are talking about placenta previa whether we are talking about abruptio both these are more common in multi gravida females whereas pih it is more common in primi gravida females clear so over here it is saying second statement was it is more common in primi gravida females no it is not more common in primi gravida females it is more common in multi gravida females so yes second statement is absolutely incorrect right now per vaginal examination now your question is talking about abruptio your question is not saying antepartum hemorrhage they are not giving you a generalized statement nor your question is specifically saying placenta previa in case of abruptio the placenta is in upper uterine segment right so if placenta is in upper uterine segment per vaginal examination can be done in abruptio but yes the condition is after ruling out placenta previa so if i have a patient of aph antepartum hemorrhage in antepartum hemorrhage in general we say that per vaginal examination is contraindicated because we haven't ruled out placenta previa once you rule out placenta previa in abruptio there is no problem in doing per vaginal examination so shubham you are right that never do pv in aph patients but here they are not talking about aph they are talking in specifically about abruptio if question is specific about abruptio you have to give a specific answer with respect to abruptio you are not going to give a generalized answer that per vaginal examination is contraindicated in aph that's a generalized statement so in case of abruptio per vaginal examination can be done please remember this in abruptio after ruling out placenta previa right as far as ultrasound is concerned remember that abruptio is a clinical diagnosis the best way of making the diagnosis of abruptio is clinically right ultrasound if they are bent upon asking you that what is the investigation of choice in uh, abruptio then it is ultrasound but otherwise in most of the cases the diagnosis of abruptio is made clinically right so in case of abruptio this statement ultrasound is diagnostic in most cases that's incorrect right why it is incorrect is because we do not do ultrasound to diagnose abruptio in case of abruptio you are going to do a clinical diagnosis so this statement is incorrect per vaginal examination yes it can be done now now in case of abruptio so many times i've told you that whenever the placenta separates thromboplastin is released and because this thromboplastin is released it initiates uterine contractions and that is why a patient of abruptio immediately goes into labor the moment the placenta separates a patient goes into labor so in case of abruptio you can have unexplained preterm labors but a patient of abruptio will never have a prolonged labor preterm labor yes it can be seen in abruptio 
precipitate labor may be seen in abruptio but prolonged labor will not be seen because immediately the moment the, pla the placenta separates you are going the, the thromboplastin will be released which is going to lead to either precipitate labor then never you are going to get prolonged labor right clear to all of you so it never leads to prolonged labor and it is this thromboplastin which is also the cause for starting the process of dic and that is why dic is a complication of abruptio it is not a complication of placenta previa right agreed have you all understood so over here the answer is option b only four is correct rest all statements are incorrect clear now suppose if they ask you what is the most common presentation of abruptio and in the options you have uh, precipitate labor you have bleeding you have pain what is the most common presentation in abruptio what's the most common presentation please remember most common presentation of abruptio is bleeding and not pain right not precipitate labor not pain not dic most common presentation is bleeding clear yes uh, anant because it can lead to dic that is why in abruptio you never wait and watch and we are going to do a next question uh, dr shivani and dr ranjan it is not pain most common presentation is not pain most common presentation is bleeding right bleeding is associated with pain in abruptio but most common presentation is not pain right clear to all of you so if you have bleeding also and pain also you are going to mark the answer as bleeding and not pain okay now coming to risk factors for placenta previa as i told you abruptio risk factors are very important placenta previa risk factors are important pih and pph these risk factors are very very important so risk factors for placenta previa three risk factors which are similar to abruptio are increased maternal age increased maternal parity and smoking right most important uh, risk, uh, risk factor for placenta previa is previous history of placenta previa second most important risk factor is previous history of cesarean section right clear to all of you now in case of placenta previa the risk other risk factors are risk factors related to uterus that is if there is a uterine surgery for example if there is previous history of dilatation and curettage previous history of uh, myomectomy then uterine anomalies like septate uterus biconvoit uterus and increase in the size of the placenta increase in size of the placenta like it is seen in twins like it is a case of succin curiate lobe right apparently the size of the placenta becomes big in succin curiate lobe so all these are risk factors for placenta previa increased maternal age increased maternal parity smoking most important is previous history of placenta previa second most important is previous history of cesarean section uterine surgeries and uterine anomalies and then increased placental size all these are risk factors for placenta previa these all you have to remember clear to all of you okay coming to next question which is a clinical question over here for you a primary gravida female at 32 weeks of gestation complains of sudden onset vaginal bleeding and lower abdominal pain now when you get a question where they are talking about bleeding and pain then you are thinking about abruptio uh prithvi joshi yes there are cases where they can be concealed hemorrhage in abruptio but then concealed hemorrhages are less common in comparison to mixed variety of abruptio and revealed variety of abruptio so think it this way in case a patient comes to you with pain in abdomen 
right and on one side patient is saying i have got bleeding which is happening after 28 weeks of pregnancy on one side patient is saying i have pain in abdomen after 28 weeks of pregnancy on the other side the question is you have the patient has bleeding after 28 weeks of pregnancy which is more specific for abruptio tell me pain in abdomen after 28 weeks of pregnancy the moment patient says i have pain in abdomen after 28 weeks of pregnancy do you think about abruptio no the moment patient says i have bleeding after 28 weeks of pregnancy you think about antepartum hemorrhage and the most common cause of antepartum hemorrhage is abruptio right clear okay bp is 80 by 60 pulse rate is 130 beats per minute uterus is tender and tense now since uterus is tender and tense again i am thinking about abruptio head is engaged fetal heart sounds are not heard on per vaginal examination cervix is closed what is the most appropriate management so i know we are dealing with a case of abruptio this clinical scenario is a case of abruptio right now in this case case the patient is in shock 80 by 60 her vitals are unstable pulse rate is 130 beats per minute so yes i am going to do resuscitative measures and simultaneously i as i told you in abruptio my aim is to deliver the patient as soon as possible because the longer is the interval between delivery and the onset of abruptio more are chances of dic so in case of abruptio please remember that i the interval between the onset of abruptio and delivery is very important this interval should be short if this interval is long if this interval is long there are increased chances of dic it is directly proportional to dic right so that is why i am not going to start terbutaline in case of abruptio tocolytics are never used right number 1 number 2 i am not going to await the spontaneous delivery of dead fetus because that will also mean prolonging the interval right then comes perform lscs or perform amniotomy and start oxytocin so yes either i have to do her vaginal delivery or i have to go for cesarean section in this case because the os is closed right so i am not i cannot do an amniotomy so this option is also gone i am going to go for perform lscs right okay now what is the mode of delivery in abruptio mode of delivery in abruptio as i told you, you the main aim is that i have to shorten the interval between the onset of abruptio and delivery so if suppose vaginal delivery is about to happen then i am going to go for vaginal delivery if it is a dead fetus then i will prefer a vaginal delivery but then please remember that in case of abruptio fetal heart sounds may not be heard because the uterus is tensed and tender so just because you are unable to hear fetal heart sounds you are not going to say it's a dead fetus you will have to do a ctg to know whether the fetus is dead or not right and third very important reason for doing vaginal delivery is if patient develops dic now if your patient develops dic then the only mode of delivery is vaginal delivery no matter what happens right so then i am not going to think about cesarean section cesarean section i am going to do if delivery is not imminent if gestational age is far from term if there is fetal distress or if mother is unstable then i am going to go for cesarean section now suppose your question says that there is a case of abruptio with dic with the fetal distress i am telling you in fetal distress you have to do cesarean section and i am telling you in dic you have to go for vaginal delivery so as an obstetrician always our aim is to protect the mother to save the life of the mother right mother comes first second is the fetus so if you have a question where there is abruptio plus dic plus fetal distress you are going to save the life of the mother in other words you are going to correct dic and go for vaginal delivery rather than cesarean section right lung maturity i told you see you as an obstetrician you are going to think about mother first 
so i have to save the life of the mother and then comes the fetus so in case of abruptio i am going to concentrate only on the mother if while saving the life of the mother i can save the life of the fetus well and good otherwise i am going to let go of the fetus and i am going to you know i am going to save the life of the mother now uh, karan you tell me at 32 weeks do you expect a ruptured ectopic tell me ruptured ectopic kab milega ruptured ectopic you are going to get in first trimester right so or maximum you can get by 14 weeks 16 weeks not more than that this patient is 32 weeks so at 32 weeks i am not expecting a ruptured ectopic right clear karan so this is not a case of ruptured ectopic more than 28 weeks pay if patient is coming to you in shock you cannot say that she is a case of ruptured ectopic right okay question number 14 i hope you understood question number 13 all of you yes yes so it happens it's okay you make mistakes here don't say sorry make mistakes here so that you don't make these mistakes in your exams and no one should be laughing no one should be judging other person sometimes it does happen you know uh, when you are reading a question you forget that this what gestational age we are talking about right okay coming to question number 14 so a 34 year old g2p1 at 31 weeks of gestation presents to labor and delivery with complaint of vaginal bleeding earlier in the day that resolved on its own now again please bachcho remember that if you are getting a patient where she says that she had bleeding earlier and now it has stopped right such recurrent bleeding episodes of recurrent bleeding they always favor placenta previa in a patient of abruptio you will never get a history that she had bleeding then it stopped and then it started again no because abruptio means if the placenta starts separating it will end in delivery right clear to all of you so this reading this history takes me towards placenta previa now she denies of any leakage of fluid or uterine contractions why have they given you this history they have given you this history because if a patient is having bleeding which is very small plus if there are uterine contractions right then you can also think about preterm labor show so this bleeding will be mucoid discharge blood mixed mucus discharge so always whenever you are getting bleeding and you are getting uterine contractions then it could be abruptio it could be placenta previa it could be an early case of preterm labor right so over here there are no contractions she reports good movements in a last pregnancy pregnancy she had a low transverse cesarean section and one of the risk factors for placenta previa i told you just now is previous history of cesarean section due to breach her vitals are normal electronic fetal heart reactive fetal heart rate no uterine contractions which of the following is the next step in management now at 31 weeks when patient gives me this history i am suspecting placenta previa now if i am suspecting placenta previa i am not going to do a per speculum examination i am not going to do a per vaginal examination i am going to go for an ultrasound examination and what ultrasound you are do first ultrasound which you do always is a trans abdominal scan right always the first ultrasound which you do is a trans abdominal scan on trans abdominal scan if you see that the placenta is lying low then you go for a trans vaginal scan and trans vaginal scan is the investigation of choice but the screening ultrasound for placenta previa is a trans abdominal ultrasound clear to all of you but the investigation of choice is trans vaginal scan right now suppose on ultrasound i see that the placenta is in upper segment then i know it's not a case of placenta previa in that case i'm going to go for a 
per vaginal examination why in abruptio i am going to go for a per vaginal examination per vaginal examination is very important in a patient of abruptio and you are going to tell me why why is per vaginal examination important in a patient of abruptio it is important why you should do a per vaginal examination in a patient of abruptio tell me quickly why you should be doing a per vaginal examination i'm waiting for your answers and the answer is hidden in whatever i have taught you till now excellent minakshi is the first one to answer this that yes for cervical dilatation because in abruptio as i said thromboplastin will be released so patient will be in labor so i have to check how much is she dilated so i will have to go for a per vaginal examination to check for dilatation of the cervix clear to all of you yes okay excellent now now as i told you per vaginal examination is important and abruptio why you gave me an answer now you are going to tell me why is tvs very very important in a patient of placenta previa why ultrasound is so important in a patient of placenta previa yes number 1 is to diagnose placenta previa number 1 yes because i want to know the exact distance between the internal os and the placental edge so in order to know the exact dis distance between the placental edge and between uh, you know uh, the internal os i am going to do a ultrasound examination in placenta previa i am going to do tvs but apart from that what other information is tvs or ultrasound going to give me in a patient of placenta previa yes it is going to tell you the grading of see grading of placenta previa again one thing i want to tell you that these days there is a new classification for placenta previa and that is low lying placenta and placenta previa low lying placenta means if the placenta reaches within 2 cm of the internal os but it does not touch or cover it and if placenta is at the level of internal os or it covers it if it is touching the internal os if it is covering it then it is placenta previa right so yes number 1 in order to decide what is the distance between the placental edge because once i decide the distance between placental edge more of delivery will be decided this is right apart from that all this is correct apart from this why this is true all of you are right more of delivery will be decided grading of placenta previa will be decided but apart from that why else am i doing placenta previa uh, why else am i doing ultrasound uh, more than congenital anomalies congenital anomalies ke liye at 32 weeks placenta previa mein you do ultrasound in the third trimester to so, congenital anomalies ke liye third trimester mein ultrasound no no yes mayank to rule out adherent placenta very good and excellent shivani in case of placenta previa there are increased chances of mal presentations the placenta is lying in the lower part of the uterus because placenta is lying in the lower part of the uterus that is why transverse lie is very common in placenta previa after transfer sly it is breach so yes i want to confirm the diagnosis number 2 i want to rule out placenta accreta number 3 i want to detect mal presentations and number 4 please remember that placenta previa is also associated with vasa previa and velamentous insertion of cord right so please remember this vasa previa ke sath bhi placenta previa is associated so vasa previa is not just seen in velamentous insertion of cord vasa previa is also associated with placenta previa 
so if you people are following me on my instagram handle you will see i have given you a new classification for vasa previa and i have told you that vasa previa is not only seen in velamentous insertion of cord it is also seen in cases of placenta previa right so these are the reasons for which i am doing ultrasound in patients of placenta previa clear to all of you right so coming to question number now management of placenta previa all of you know when you have to go for expectant management and when you have to go for active management if your patient's vitals are unstable if patient is continuously bleeding if there is fetal distress if a, a gestational age is more than equal to 37 weeks or if there is a congenital anomaly which makes uh, the fetus incompatible with life that congenital anomaly is incompatible with life in all those conditions we go for active management otherwise we go for expectant management what is the regime for expectant management of placenta previa called as what is the regime called as the regime for expectant management of placenta previa i'm waiting for your answer so i know all of you know but i since there is a lag i'm just waiting mac cafe and johnson regime right so uh, we are going to expectant management is mac cafe and johnson regime mode of delivery if it is a low lying placenta that means placenta reaches within 2 cm of the internal os but it does not touch or cover it then you can try vaginal delivery if placenta is covering the internal os you are going to go for cesarean section now please remember that cesarean section most of the times we do a lower segment cesarean section but sometimes if you have an anteriorly placed placenta previa with blood vessels covering the internal os then in that case you may have to go for classical cesarean section but most of the times we are going to go for lower segment cesarean section in placenta previa right okay now comes risk factors for pph r number 1 advanced maternal age number 2 pih number 3 diabetes number 4 anemia out of these you have to tell option a says all four option b says 1 3 and 4 option c says 1 and 3 and option d says 3 and 4 so a b c or d i have started getting all your answers and all of you are saying it's a majority yes rather till now i have got only a all of you are saying all four correct yes all four are risk factors for pph risk factors for pph are very very important now all the risk factors for pph i am making you uh, write down a list you can copy this list later on no bachcho option a is right option a is the correct answer all four are risk factors so please write down risk factors for pph risk factors related to mother if mother is obese if she is a grand multipara that means if there she has undergone five or more than five deliveries if age is more than 40 years then that's a risk factor if there is previous history of pph or previous history of manual removal of placenta presently if the uterus is over distended and when will you get over distended uterus in case of polyhydramnios in case of twin pregnancy in case of diabetes then presently if she is hypertensive diabetic anemic or if in present pregnancy she has antepartum hemorrhage or morbidly adherent placenta so related to mother if she is obese if she is a grand multipara if age is more than 40 years previous history of pph or previous history of manual removal of placenta in present pregnancy if there is over distended uterus hypertension diabetes anemia antepartum hemorrhage morbidly adherent placenta 
or if in present pregnancy she had a prolonged labor or precipitate labor precipitate labor means when the entire process of delivery is complete within 3 hours if the entire process of delivery is complete within 3 hours if there has been a prolonged use of oxytocin in other words if there has been induction of labor or augmentation of labor or if there has been a prolonged use of tocolytics then there are risk factors why prolonged use of oxytocin leads to pph because the uterus becomes exhausted when you have used a lot of oxytocin uterus was contracting and now it has become uh, exhausted prolonged history of tocolytics again is going to lead to pph if there is a uterine fibroid or uterine anomalies all these are risk factors for pph right so these are very very important risk factors all these risk factors they should be on your tips for the upcoming neat exam now risk factors for pph advanced maternal age yes more the female more than 40 years pih yes diabetes yes anemia yes why diabetes because in diabetes there will be polyhydramnios right and polyhydramnios is going to lead to over distension of the uterus clear ashwarya i hope this is clear to all of you ashwarya sagar clear to all of you yes diabetes is going to lead to polyhydramnios and polyhydramnios is going to lead to over distension of the uterus so again that's a risk factor right so the answer over here is option a that is all four are correct right okay coming to question number 15 which is based on management of pph see in pph risk factors are important and the algorithm for management of pph is important and the drug dosages which are used for medical management are important right okay so question number 15 a female after delivery was noted to have pph on examination uterine fundus was soft but it became firm on massaging so uterine fundus was soft she was given oxytocin but her bleeding didn't stop uterine fundus showed intermittent relaxation a dose of carboprost and insertion of bakri balloon catheter also didn't stop the bleeding right okay telling just wait just just let's go with the next question and then i'll come to your questions also wait so a dose of carboprost and insertion of bakri balloon catheter didn't stop the bleeding patient's vitals are 122 beats per minute and bp is 90 by 60 mm of mercury patient is taken up for laparotomy the next step is so what is the next step tell me so some of you are saying option d some are saying option c some are saying option b and now someone has also said a so we have variety of answers for this question a b c and d many many answers i am getting okay so yes uh, majority of you are correct so let us quickly see the algorithm for management of pph now this algorithm you are going to remember in the same sequence which i am telling you all the students who are from maro you know this algorithm already but if you have not taken lectures from me please remember this algorithm and you are going to remember it in the same order in which i am telling you okay so if you are from maro and you are answering it incorrectly that means you are not applying your brains read the question carefully first let me tell you the algorithm and i am not looking at your answers now i get distracted okay so first thing whenever a patient comes to you with bleeding you have to go for resuscitation right and what are you going to do in resuscitation you are going to call for help you are going to insert two large bore iv cannulas 
so you are going to insert which cannulas which number cannulas are you going to insert when we say two large bore iv cannulas which number cannulas are do you use tell me which number cannulas are you going to use i'm waiting for your answers quickly write down in the chat box what cannulas are you going to use yes 14 or 16 gauge cannulas right tell me the colors of these cannulas tell me the color of 14 number cannula iv cannula and 16 number iv cannula which one is green color and which one is orange 14 and 16 yes very good minakshi orange and grey right okay now i also will start an infusion right i am going to start a either ringer lactate or normal saline or dextrose 5% this statement which i said is it right i can start dextrose 5% or not can i start dextrose 5% in a patient of pph yes or no write this and tell me tell me can i start ho gaya cannula ka color ho gaya now tell me can we start dextrose 5% or not no shivani has said no we cannot start dextrose 5% why you cannot start dextrose 5% yes because if i start dextrose 5% in patients of pph we have to give oxytocin for a very long time and that can lead to water intoxication and that is why dextrose 5% is not started in a patient of pph you are going to start either ringer lactate or normal saline right you are going to use electrolyte rich media you are not going to start electrolyte deficient media in a patient of pph right then i am going to give oxygen by mask and now while i am resuscitating i am going to place my hand on the fundus of the uterus to check the tone of the uterus because if uterus is soft or if the fundus of the uterus is not palpable that means i am dealing with atonic pph but if uterus the fundus of the uterus is firm that means i am dealing with traumatic pph and simultaneously i will also do a per vaginal examination to check that the entire placenta is out so resuscitate your patient put your hand on the fundus of the uterus to know whether you are dealing with atonic pph or whether you are dealing with traumatic pph in atonic pph fundus of the uterus will be soft or it will not be palpable like in this question they have said fundus of the uterus is soft right and when you are going to massage it it is going to become firm but in case of traumatic pph the fundus of the uterus already will be firm right and simultaneously please do a, a per vaginal examination to ensure that the entire placenta is out now once you are sure that the entire placenta is out no part of the placenta is inside and you are sure that you are dealing with atonic pph now continue massaging the uterus and give injection tranexa 1 gram slowly right and simultaneously start uterotonic drugs now the first line drug which you start is oxytocin which you are going to give 20 international units and as i told you oxytocin is never to be started in dextrose 5% you are going to use either ringer lactate or you are going to use normal saline oxytocin should be given by iv infusion or by im never iv bolus never iv bolus because if you give uh, oxytocin iv bolus it can lead to hypotension it can lead to cardiac arrest now an add on drug along with oxytocin which you can use is mesoprost mesoprost the dose of mesoprost which you use to treat pph is 800 micrograms sublingually this is the dose which is recommended by who 
right 800 micrograms sublingually but then misoprost can also be used iv uh, can also be used per rectally right so misoprost can be used per rectally and when you use misoprost per rectally to treat pph then it is 800 to 1000 micrograms who recommends 800 micrograms sublingually right but when you are using it per rectally that's an off label use of misoprost who is not recommending it but we do use it per rectally and then the dose is 800 to 1000 micrograms earlier it was 1000 micrograms per rectally now it is 800 to 1000 micrograms per rectally right similarly for uh, you know active management of third stage of labor there is an update which i have to give you in active management of third stage of labor that is for profile axis of pph the dose of misoprost which was recommended was 600 micrograms sublingually now they say 400 to 600 micrograms right earlier it was simply 600 micrograms now they say 400 to 600 micrograms clear to all of you yes this is an update now so i am you what am i doing i am giving uterine massage i am using injection tranexamic acid 1 gram slow iv then i am also using oxytocin along with oxytocin i may use misoprost now if patient is still bleeding then i am going to go to the second line drugs which are methergen and the best drug is injection carboprost now the dose of carboprost is very very important please remember that the dose of carboprost is 250 micrograms im you can repeat uh, carboprost every 15 to 90 minutes and you can repeat it till up till maximum 8 doses maximum you can use 8 doses that means maximum you can give 2 mg right now this is the best drug to treat pph now all this i am going to try maximum medical management i am going to try maximum for 30 minutes if in 30 minutes bleeding is not controlled then i am going to go for a balloon tamponade right one very important thing is in which condition is carboprost contra indicated carboprost is contra indicated in asthmatic patients very very important yes and it is also a contra indicated in amniotic fluid embolism patients and it should be used very very carefully in patients of hypertension then balloon temp, uh, injection methergen is, is absolutely contra indicated in hypertensive patients right so uh, methergen is absolutely contra indicated in hypertensive patients carboprost is also contra indicated in asthmatic patients which is an absolute contra indication relative contra indication is hypertension right then comes that's a relative contra indication now coming to uh, the second step as i told you that for 30 minutes i'm going to try medical management but in 30 minutes if bleeding doesn't stop i'm going to go to the next step which is a balloon tamponade which you are going to do with bakri balloon catheter right or you can use an sb esophageal catheter or you can use a catheter made up of condom right maximum capacity of bakri balloon catheter is 500 ml now if this also fails to stop the bleeding then you have to see whether the vitals of the patient are stable or unstable if vitals of your patient are stable then you are going to apply b link sutures or if facility for uterine artery embolization is available in the hospital you are going to go for uterine artery embolization please remember b link sutures will be applied only if the vitals of the patient are stable right if vitals of the patient are unstable then i am not going to apply b link sutures then i am going to go for devascularization surgery right so after this 
once you have done mechanical method balloon tamponade check whether the vitals are stable or unstable vital stable you can apply beeling sutures or you can go for uterine artery embolization vitals unstable you are going to go for devascularization surgery now when we go for devascularization surgery the sequence in which i'm going to ligate the vessels which was asked in your last year neat exam also is that first you are going to do a bilateral ligation of uterine artery then you are going to go for a bilateral ligation of the ovarian artery the anastomosis the uterine ovarian anastomosis and then you are going to see whether the bleeding is continuing or not so first i'm going to ligate uterine artery then i'm going to ligate ovarian artery and again i have to see whether the bleeding is continuing or not now if bleeding is continuing then again check the vitals of the patient most of the times if bleeding continues at this stage most of the times vitals of the patient will be unstable and you will have to proceed to a subtotal hysterectomy rarely the vitals of the patient will be stable and if vitals of the patient are stable then you can ligate anterior division of internal iliac artery so if they ask you the sequence in which the arteries are ligated first one is you have to ligate uterine artery then ovarian artery and then anterior division of internal iliac artery right please remember the hysterectomy which is done in patients of pph better is subtotal hysterectomy right where you are removing only the uterus and not the cervix clear to all of you yes so this is the algorithm for management of pph i hope we are clear on this okay so if you are clear on this now come to your question your question was saying that the patient's fundus was soft she is bleeding so that means we are dealing with atonic pph and the question is saying that oxytocin was given it didn't stop the bleeding now they are saying that you are going to go for they did carb they gave carboprost and they did a bakri balloon catheter right now bakri balloon catheter has been done and after bakri balloon catheter the vitals of the patient are unstable pulse rate 122 bp 90 by 60 so if vitals are unstable am i going to go for beeling sutures no if vitals are unstable what is the next step next step is devascularization surgery and you are going to go for bilateral uterine artery ligation now uh, dna if you are asking me which is better b link or uterine artery embolization that depends upon the facility which is there in your hospital if embolization facility is present and an interventional cardiac radiologist can come and do uterine artery embolization well and good if it is not available then b link both are equally the same and both options will not be given to you right clear okay so this question all of you understand that the answer is going to be bilateral uterine artery ligation uh, coming to question number 16 an intern conducts a delivery immediately after delivery mother experiences breathlessness hypotension tachycardia and she collapses on per vaginal examination is normal and there is no excess blood loss most probable diagnosis is tell me what is the most probable diagnosis mam video will post what do you mean by that sangat a video will post video will remain here i am not going to remove it so what is your answer now what is the most probable diagnosis shivani you have been giving me so nice answers what has happened read the question carefully this time you answered incorrectly just because the word is immediate you are not going to say it is uterine inversion shivani read the question properly immediately ke sath sath kya diya hai immediately ke sath sath kya diya hai immediately ke sath sath the question is saying that there is breathlessness there is hypotension number 1 number 2 if you are thinking about so let's rule out all the options and see what answer we are coming to 
so pph patient is in shock we are know this now this patient is in shock and is it a case of pph yes or no why not pph why aren't you people answering the answer as pph because the question itself is saying there is no excessive blood loss because there is no excessive blood loss it cannot be pph right this is clear to all of you yes now now let's talk about uterine inversion why not uterine inversion now in case of uterine inversion yes this word image it it is going in favor of uterine inversion but in uterine inversion do you get breathlessness no patient is not going to get breathlessness or hypotension it is a neurogenic shock in uterine inversion number 2 it is not uterine inversion why because per vaginal examination findings are normal in case of uterine inversion when you will do a per vaginal examination you are going to feel the fundus of the uterus and vagina right so it cannot be a case of uterine inversion because per vaginal examination findings are normal please remember in uterine inversion the first shock which happens is neurogenic shock so yes it is immediate later on patient has hemorrhagic shock so just because they have written no excessive blood loss doesn't mean it cannot be uterine inversion it can be a case of uterine inversion but i am ruling out uterine inversion because per vaginal examination is normal number 1 number 2 because patient is having breathlessness and hypotension breathlessness that is if the patient is having cardiac symptoms as well as patient is is in shock it goes in favor of amniotic fluid embolism in amniotic fluid embolism per vaginal examination findings will be normal and there won't be any excessive blood loss so i have just made a table for you over here which is about a postpartum collapse or shock so these are the things which will help you in deciding that whether we are dealing with pph whether we are dealing with uterine inversion or amniotic fluid embolism time of occurrence now when we are talking about immediately after delivery primary pph it occurs within 24 hours of delivery so primary pph any time the question can say within 24 hours of delivery patient had delivered uterine inversion acute uterine inversion also happens within 24 hours of delivery but amniotic fluid embolism it happens at the time of labor or within 30 minutes of delivery right so in a patient of amniotic fluid embolism you will never get this history that 24 hours before she had delivered no delivery is going to happen immediately or within 30 minutes of delivery patient is going to have amniotic fluid embolism presenting feature in pph is excessive bleeding in case of uterine inversion also there is excessive bleeding and there is shock but initially shock is out of proportion to the bleeding right because initially it is neurogenic shock later on there is uh hemorrhagic shock so in case of pph shock and bleeding are in proportion to each other in case of uterine inversion shock and bleeding are out of proportion shock is more bleeding is less because the first episode of shock which happens is due to neurogenic shock right now in case of amniotic fluid embolism the presenting features are initially in the first phase there is cardiac and respiratory failure so you are going to get symptoms like hypotension tachycardia breathlessness right cardiac arrest or coma and then you are going to get in the second phase if patient survives the first phase then patient goes into dic so in the first phase you are going to get cardiac and respiratory failure in the second phase there will be dic and in the second phase there will be bleeding in the first phase there is no bleeding right then on per abdominal examination in case of pph which the most common variety is atonic pph so the tone of the uterus is absent in case of uterine inversion you get a cup like depression just below the umbilicus in case of amniotic fluid uh, embolism the tone of the uterus will be absolutely normal so uterus will be normal where do you feel the fundus of the uterus immediately after delivery immediately after delivery the fundus of the uterus is felt just below the umbilicus or at the level of the umbilicus right 
on per vaginal examination in case of pph bleeding will be present in case of uterine inversion a rounded mass will fill the vagina so there will be a fundus of the uterus which is filling the vagina and bleeding can be present in amniotic fluid uh, embolism per vaginal examination will be absolutely normal so because in this question per vaginal examination is absolutely normal and because you are getting cardiac and respiratory failure so this is a case of amniotic fluid embolism and it is not a case of uterine inversion not a case of pph clear to all of you question number 16 yes Now I want you to see these two figures. One figure is that of uterine inversion and the other is that of prolapse. Now as a spotter you can get this. So tell me image A and image B. What is image A depicting and what is image B depicting? What is image A and what is image B? tell me quickly what is image a showing to you and what is image b showing to you image a is uterine inversion and image b prolapse yes all of you are right how are you going to know whether you are dealing with prolapse or whether you are dealing with uterine inversion if you can see the os right if os is visible it means it's a case of prolapse in image a it is just the fundus of the uterus so in uterine inversion the fundus of the uterus is going to come out first right so because the fundus of the uterus is going to come out first so there is no os seen and that is why this is a case of uterine inversion so image a is uterine inversion image b is prolapse a utero cervical prolapse right okay now how to differentiate between a prolapsing fibroid so this is a fibroid which is prolapsed and this is uterine inversion right how are you going to differentiate between prolapsing fibroid and inversion of the uterus again very important now in how are you going to differentiate on per abdominal examination on per abdominal examination in a prolapsing fibroid fundus of the uterus is palpable so fundus is palpable in case of uterine inversion fundus is not palpable in other words you get a cup like depression right so either your question is going to say the uterus is not palpable or if they are going to say that there is a cup like depression right number 2 now in case of prolapsing fibroid a sound can be taken inside a uterine sound you can take a uterine sound inside the uterus in case of a inversion of the uterus a uterine sound cannot be taken inside so that is what is called, called as the sound test right so in case of uterine inversion you cannot take a uterine sound inside in case of a prolapsing fibroid you can take the fibro you can take a uterine sound inside so these are all questions which they ask you to differentiate between fibroid between uh um, uterine inversion between prolapse between uterine inversion right clear to all this are clinically i am not telling you any investigation ishan we are talking about clinical differentiation between these things because in your exams they want to see whether you are attending your clinics or not now even if you are not attending your clinics if you know these clinical points then you will be able to answer all your questions right I think this is the last question for the day for just now I have another session with you at 5:30 but for this session this is the last question a 37 year old female G2P1 presents at 32 weeks with complaint of vaginal bleeding her vitals are BP 110 by 70 pulse 87 on per abdominal examination no contractions are present 
height of the uterus is two third distance between umbilicus and ziphy sternum so it is this is the umbilicus this is ziphy sternum so this is one third this is two third right so it is two third distance between umbilicus and ziphy sternum on ultrasound placenta is located on the anterior wall of the uterus and covers the internal os completely which of the following would increase her risk for hysterectomy right so which of the following is going to increase her risk for hysterectomy option a placenta accreta option b development of dic option c smoking option d desire for sterilization tell me i can see three answers only just now two of you have said a 1 c so most of you are saying it's option a yes so first let me clarify the height of the uterus see height of the uterus at 12 weeks uterus is felt at the level of pubic symphysis then midway between umbilicus and pubic symphysis 16 weeks lower border of umbilicus 20 weeks upper border of umbilicus 24 weeks my pen is not working just give me 2 minutes upper border of umbilicus 24 weeks one third distance between umbilicus and ziphy sternum 28 weeks two third distance 32 weeks at the level of ziphy sternum 36 weeks and then at 40 weeks it is the same height as that of 32 weeks right so over here height has nothing to do patient is 32 weeks pregnant and it is being uterus is felt at two third distance between umbilicus and ziphy sternum so per abdominally everything is fine now on ultrasound you are seeing that there is placenta previa right now this patient is a g2 p1 patient and you the question is telling you that there is a placenta previa now which of the following would increase her risk for hysterectomy so please remember that in present pregnancy if patient has placenta previa then there is increased risk of placenta accreta right there are two very important risk factors for placenta accreta present pregnancy may if there is placenta previa and plus in previous pregnancy if she had undergone cesarean section so present pregnancy placenta previa is a very very important risk factor for placenta accreta all the risk factors which i have told you for placenta previa are also the risk factors for placenta accreta and once i diagnose placenta accreta during pregnancy how am i going to diagnose uh, placenta accreta during pregnancy the investigation of choice is ultrasound plus doppler most of the cases of placenta accreta can be diagnosed on ultrasound and doppler right risk factors they are same like placenta previa so once i have diagnosed that my patient is a case of placenta accreta what is the management the treatment of choice is deliver the patient by cesarean section followed by hysterectomy so the management becomes cesarean hysterectomy right so yes placenta accreta increases her chances for undergoing hysterectomy now tell me i am saying that on ultrasound we can diagnose placenta accreta so what are the findings which you can get on uh, ultrasound which tell you that you are dealing with a case of placenta accreta tell me what findings on ultrasound tell you that you are dealing with a case of placenta accreta quickly write down the findings i am waiting for your answers in the chat box just write down those findings retro placental lacunae so it is placental lakes in the myometrium very good it's placental lakes which is also called as placental lacunae in myometrium very good 
then that's one thing got it next any other finding any other finding giving the myometrium a very heterogeneous kind of an appearance and what else three findings you have to tell me any other finding so i think a uh, absent nita book layer anshu is an histopathological examination finding excellent shivani loss of hypoechoic zone this hypoechoic zone is present below the placenta and it is it is for the decidua basalis right so that decidua basalis is absent very good and yeah that is done sub placental sonolucent area absent that is loss number 2 number 3 there is loss of distinction between the bladder so there is a fine distinction between the bladder and the placenta so there is a loss of distinction between bladder and placenta or the uterus so the proper distinction which was present between bladder and placenta that is absent now right all this what you are saying heterogeneous appearance of placenta that is placental lakes loss of hypoechoic zone and loss of distinction between the bladder and placenta now on histopathological examination what finding are you going to get there will be absent nita books layer absent nita books layer now suppose on ultrasound if i have doubt that whether i am dealing with placenta accreta or not then what is the gold standard what is the gold standard just right bladder between bladder and uterus either the question option will say bladder and uterus or bladder and placenta i am not saying uterus just oh baba this over here so this is placenta accreta so between bladder and uterus or bladder and placenta the fine distinction which was there will not be present right mri gold standard is mri clear to all of you so this is placenta accreta and whenever there is placenta accreta it is a placenta accreta syndrome which includes placenta accreta increta and percreta so whatever i have i have told you about placenta accreta it is true for placenta accreta increta percreta everything right so that's all what i wanted to discuss with you in bleeding in pregnancy now we are going to meet again today at 5:30 for your week 2 discussion where we will be talking about diabetes pih then uh, rh negative pregnancy all that yes it has to be elective cesarean right uh, salman it is not necessary that gold standard always is invasive it's not that ki hamesha gold standard invasive hoga that's not there that's not true most of the times it's invasive but over here the investigation of choice is ultrasound and on ultrasound if it is not if you cannot uh, with surety say that you're dealing with placenta accreta then you are going to say uh, mri and i was just reading harit's question what is that acha if they want to frame the question keeping dic in mind they are going to give you the coagulation profile of the patient they are going to say that serum fibrinogen levels were decreased fibrin degradation products were increased they are going to give you the coagulation profile then only they are going to want the answer as dic right something should be present then only you are going to say it is DIC so coagulation profile will be mentioned to you then you are going to say that you are dealing with a case of DIC clear to all of you yes now uh, dipanvita uh, anemia in anemia whenever there is anemia there is hemodilution 
right and there is a thinning of blood rather i should say and because of that you know there are excess chances of pph right in case of anemia because of the thinning of blood there are excess chances of pph okay so i think that's all for now we are going to meet at 5:30 and again the session will be between from 5:30 to 7 o'clock right okay take care see you at 5:30 then